It's a good Ag AM in Kansas morning. Good morning. Let's take a look and see what's coming up today. First, Dr. Chris Blevins and Dr. Lori Beard discuss vesicular stomatitis, a contagious disease in horses. Next, Kristen Butts explains the risk assessments provided by the NCBA regarding the importation of meat from Argentina and Brazil. Then learn how the neutron access tubes relate to cover crops and soil moisture. And take a look at options for windbreaks to protect cows and calves. We'll end with a story about a couple of oxen and see how well a K-State student handles them. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress. Powered by Kansas Farmers. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Hello and welcome to Horse and Around. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. Today joined by Dr. Lori Beard and she is a clinical professor here in the equine section and internal medicine specialist in the equine department. And today I think what we're going to talk about is something that is of a concern for horse owners, especially when they travel, and that's vesicular stomatitis. And Dr. Beard, what is vesicular stomatitis uh, as far as what owners may need to know about that uh, disease? So uh, vesicular stomatitis is a virus. Um, it is um, contagious to not only horses, but other large animals as well. Um, and it results in ulceration of the mouth, gums, and does result in some coronary band lesions as well. And so with that virus and what owners would see clinically being that kind of uh, mouth type aspects, the lesions within the mouth or maybe even the coronary band, what else uh, would an owner be concerned with uh, with that uh, disease? Would there be anything else? Uh, do they feel sick or anything else? Yeah, that? yeah. so they, they do um, start out with a fever. Mm. Um, so that might be the first thing you notice the animal, you know, depressed, not eating very well. The other thing you might notice is difficulties eating, maybe a lot of salivation. Mm. Um, so that would prompt you to probably um, take a look in the horse's mouth um, to see if you see um, any erosions that are resulting in this. Okay. And then the other thing would be, how do horses get this disease? Yeah, very good question. So this is actually carried by a large number of different um, insects. So that's how it's probably spread from horse farm to horse farm. But certainly the other thing that can happen is this, once a horse starts showing clinical signs or any other large animal, then it could be spread by direct contact or um, things like fomites such as hands, water buckets, those sort of things. And uh, I think that something that has been a big concern is just traveling horses going to shows. And you said kind of horse to horse. Uh, what would, I guess, be of a concern or how would owners know if uh, there's an issue potentially with vesicular somatitis in different regions? So I think that right now there is an outbreak going on in mm -hmm. the uh, western part of the United States. Yep. I think there's five um, states that are having an outbreak currently right now. And so like local veterinarians when they're doing health papers then would be able to know uh, as they're traveling with those horses? Local veterinarians, I mean, when they're doing health certificates, mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to take that's part of your physical exam is looking in the horse's mouth. Do you see any evidence of that? Um, and then provided the horse is healthy, we can write the health papers for that. The other thing would be, say they were at a show, now they're worried about there was a horse that had vesicular somatitis, they've come back home. What's kind of the incubation period or like if they were exposed, when would they maybe show clinical signs or have the disease? It's roughly a week. Okay, all right. And so that would be something where owners could definitely be cognizant of, keeping track of, talking to their veterinarian, I guess, if they have any concerns yeah. with the disease. The big thing, if they see any evidence that they've got something like this, is call your veterinarian. It's a reportable disease. Mm. So your veterinarian would look at the horse and then contact the appropriate authorities if he thought or he or she thought that that was a possibility. Okay, well that's great information. I think if you ever have any questions about vesicular stomatitis or any other horse type of diseases, uh, Dr. Lori Beard is here at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center to help answer some of those questions or ask your own veterinarian about different things that might have uh, issues with of your horse. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins for Horsing Around and we'll see you around.
Hey folks, Dr. Dan here, and I'm inviting you to come to the McCain Auditorium on October 12th to be a part of the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture Series. And the featured speaker will be Greg Page. He's going to discuss climate change and agriculture. When you think of climate change and the impact that agriculture may have on it, everybody involved with agriculture needs to be there. I hope that you can attend. We'll see you on the Kansas State campus. Again, that's October 12th, McCain Auditorium, and I'll see you down the road. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. Ag AM in Kansas is brought to you in part by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. Christina Butts here with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association based in Washington, D.C. and really excited to be in Kansas this week visiting with a lot of producers. Another topic that a lot of our producers are interested in and talking about, and you've got a lot of champions from the Kansas delegation in Washington, is on two rules that became final the end of June. And this is out of USDA's uh, department, which is known as APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And these two final rules are actually allowing the fresh and frozen beef importation from two countries, Argentina and Brazil. So just to be on the record, NCBA and our membership are very much so pro-trade. But when you start looking at the history of a disease known as foot and mouth disease in these two countries, we want to make sure that our country and our government is doing its due diligence to ensure that every safeguard is in place in those two respective countries to keep a virus like FMD out of the United States. Because no amount of trade is worth jeopardizing our domestic herd health, and that's a priority for NCBA and our membership. Um, NCBA utilized membership dollars once again. We actually commissioned two third-party risk assessments for them to actually review the documents that USDA put forward that NCBA also reviewed. Um, we were able to share a lot of that information in our comments, sharing concerns with the agency about the process that they went through to deem those countries as safe. When you look at the history of it and you go back to 2002, USDA conducted a quantitative risk assessment, so a more thorough risk assessment on a country, Uruguay, who's also had a history with foot and mouth disease to ensure that those safeguards are in place and that that trade is safe trade from an animal health standpoint. Unfortunately, when APHIS went through the risk assessments for both Brazil and Argentina, it was a qualitative risk assessment. So in our opinion, not one that's more thorough than a quantitative risk assessment. So we've been asking the agency for several months and a year to actually conduct a more thorough risk assessment to go back to the countries, conduct some on-site visits, and have written reports brought back forward to the industry to help us understand what those safeguards are and to ensure that they're going to be in place to, again, protect the herd of our domestic beef herd here in the United States. So we do have some language included in both the House and the Senate agricultural spending bills. Um, that language is language that would actually not allow those final regulations to be implemented until a more thorough risk assessment is completed with additional on-site visits and those written reports back to Congress and a broader discussion about what this means. From a regulatory standpoint, the next step in the process would be for those two respective countries, now that APHIS from an animal health standpoint has deemed them as safe, even though NCBA disagrees with the process that APHIS underwent, but now those countries would have to request equivalency. So the Food Safety Inspection Service under USDA will have to go down to those two countries and ensure that their pathogen testing standards as well as their residue testing standards are as thorough and as strong as the United States or stronger before that trade would actually be implemented and we would see meat coming across the border. So again, we have a small window of time here, probably six months, maybe a little bit longer when you start looking at the equivalency process and how that works through the system. So NCBA is going to remain committed to this. Again, it's about the process that our government went through to ensure that we are protecting the safety of our animal herd here in the United States. A disease like foot and mouth disease would really be devastating to our industry, not only our industry, but other food animal industries as well. So we need to make sure that the science is there, that it's strongly supported by science, and that the process is thorough that our government underwent. And right now we disagree with our government on the process that they underwent, and we're asking them to really kind of take a step back before 
the actual beef comes into the United States and conduct a more thorough risk assessment and have additional on-site visits just to ensure those safeguards are strong and that they are in place. Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. As fourth generation farmers themselves, they understand the importance of using the correct products on every acre. Farmers helping farmers. Heinen Brothers Ag offers quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia. Call today at 800-760-4964 or find us online at heinenbrothersag.com. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. Now another gardening tip with Annette Jackson. Now is the time to overseed your lawn. The success of your lawn depends on the quality you plant and the proper fertilizer. Plant 100% weed-free seed with top-rated varieties tested by KSU. Always use Fertilome New Lawn Starter for faster, stronger root development. Don't waste time and money with lower quality seed from the box stores. Join the Jackson's Greenhouse WIVW Garden Club and save 10% on your lawn seed and Fertilome New Lawn Starter. Earlier in my life, I rode bucking horses and rodeos, and my shoulders took such a beating, and that was probably the reason for having several previous surgeries on both shoulders. About a year ago, I decided that I didn't want to have another surgery, and so I contacted Kansas Regenerative Medicine, took their treatment process. It was relatively pain-free. Now, after eight months, my shoulders have healed to the point where I think I'm probably 90 to 95 percent of normal. It takes a couple of months to start to see results with stem cell injections, but at about three to three and a half months, I started to, to feel better. I started to have less pain and feel real progress. That continued to increase gradually until now at approximately eight months, and I'm extremely pleased. I've got full range of motion. I can lift weights, I can throw, I can do uh, a lot of things that uh, I couldn't do without a lot of pain previously. This segment brought to you by Heinen Brothers Ag. Farmers helping farmers by offering quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia. Call today to protect your crop yield. In recent years, we're beginning to focus more on the soil moisture status and how these cover crops affect soil moisture. What we have going on behind us is they're installing neutron access tubes so we can measure the status of the soil moisture down to 9 or 10 feet and look at water extraction through the profile and we'll continue that through the cover crop phase and up until we plant the sorghum. And the intent is to get a handle on what's going on with soil moisture when we insert cover crops into a no-till cropping system. Some hesitance arises in the use of cover crops relative to what's the impact on my next crop? Will it use too much soil moisture? Crop yields so far have indicated that it's in this area, in this part of the state, it's probably not an issue, but by installing these neutron access tubes, we can get a better handle on exactly what's going on with soil moisture below those cover crops and relative to, say, a fallow or a double crop soybean understand better if it's the effect we're seeing in the either the sorghum phase and sometimes we see effects even in the soybean and the wheat phase of the three-year rotation. If it's due to nitrogen effects, nitrogen cycling and tie up in the residues, uh, uptake and uh, sequestration in those residues and, and subsequent release, or if it's due to water dynamic. In a different study that would indicate some of these cover crops can extract water down to 10 feet deep, and, and those are the uh, deep tap-rooted uh, brassicas, radishes, and rapeseed, for instance. By the same token, with adequate rainfall over the winter and in the spring, we saw minimal to no effect the next, on the next year's corn crop. In some of the research we've seen so far is that, yes, you extract more water during the summer growing season, but over the winter where you've had cover crops, you've got more residue, 
and we make up a lot of that during that winter and early spring season, especially going uh, ahead of sorghum. And so the net result has so far been either neutral or positive, and long term we hope to build soil structure, soil organic matter, and all the other benefits uh, that you, in, you achieve with cover crops. Hey, it's Dr. Dan here inviting you to Animal Science and Industries Family and Friends Reunion. Whether you're an alumnus, a family member, or a friend like myself, I would encourage you to attend the Family and Friends Reunion on October 9th as a way to network, connect, or reconnect with friends of yours in your segment of the livestock industry. K-State has many traditions. Agriculture and football are at the top of the list. So I'll see you in Manhattan, Kansas on October 9th for the Animal Science and Industries Family and Friends Reunion. Now another gardening tip with Annette Jackson. Fall is a great time to plant trees, shrubs, and perennials. Root development this fall means more growth with less watering next year. For faster root growth, always use Vertilone Root Stimulator. It is the only stimulator which contains IBA rooting hormone. Use Vertilone tree and shrub food after the plant has been planted for a month. Save 25% now on Jackson's homegrown hardy perennials. Let Jackson's friendly staff help you select the best plants for your landscape. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. When your living depends on agriculture, you can depend on KFRM 550 AM. If you're in the southwest three-fourths of Kansas or the northern half of Oklahoma, catch us at 550 AM on the radio dial. But if that isn't you, listen on your cell phone at TuneIn Radio or on your computer at KFRM.com. We promise to keep you informed, entertained, and company as you go through your day. KFRM 550 AM, the voice of the plains. We would like to join your management team. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. To see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Good morning, I'm Charlie Bard with K-State Research and Extension Forestry. I'd like to visit with you today about windbreaks. We were just on a field day here with the KLA and we saw some excellent windbreaks that were put in to protect the cows and calves as they were calving in the, in the fall and the spring. Whenever you can provide wind protection for cattle uh, during the cold winter weather, they'll have to eat less feed to get through uh, the cold weather and especially the calves will be healthier because they won't be so, so subject to the cold wind chill. Uh, cattle will feel wind chill just like people do and uh, and that can really be a problem. Uh, what we saw on this property here was some beautiful windbreaks that were planted back in 1984 and they're used to uh, protect their areas where they bring in their cows to, to calve and, and to get settled in. Uh, a good windbreak, we need to start really with eastern red cedar. Uh, that's our native evergreen tree to the state of Kansas and a couple of rows of eastern red cedar. Uh, spaced about uh, within the row about 10 feet apart and between rows about 20 feet apart uh, really form the basic backbone of the windbreak. If there's space to put in additional rows, a row of a hardwood tree, something like a bur oak or a honey locust, they'll get real tall, will actually help the windbreak quite a bit. The height of the windbreak uh, determines how far downwind the zone will be protected. Uh, so the cedars do the most of the, the heavy lifting of the windbreak as the backbone we're having some taller Hardwood trees help extend that protection area downwind. And then if you have interest in wildlife or aesthetics, uh, adding in some flowering or fruiting shrub rows also help improve the low level density of the windbreak, help trap more snow within the windbreak, and also provide some additional wildlife habitat. Uh, if you go with the eastern red cedar, uh, they're pretty much a bulletproof uh, tree. Uh, but if you don't want to use eastern red cedar, you can use oriental arborvitae, but they are also prone to uh, bagworms that will need to be sprayed occasionally 
in early summer when the bagworms are bad. And uh, that we can't really recommend many pine trees for the main part of the windbreak uh, because of insect and disease problems on our pine trees here in Kansas. Uh, for additional information, they can go to the Kansas Forest Service website. That is website is www.kansasforest.org. Uh, Kansas Forest with an S on the end, .org or call their uh, state office number at 785-532-3300 and uh, tell the person what you're interested in and they can put you in contact with a local district forester who could uh, come out to your farm or ranch property, help you design a windbreak and help you get the seedlings you need. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We're having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. Tallgrass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tallgrass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Good morning, my name's Anna Lemon. I'm from Lenexa, Kansas, but I live in Manhattan and I'm a senior at K-State in Animal Science. These are my two oxen, Tip and then his half-brother, Buck. They're both milking shorthorn steers. They're 10 years old. I got my start with them at Mahaffey House in Olathe, Kansas, when I worked there. And then about a year and a half after I quit working there, I just happened to stop by and they had tore down their barn and decided to ask if they'd like to sell them and I bought them and here we are today. I go around to different little historical events. Um, Mahaffey House, we'll go back to Mahaffey House or there's a deal in Gardner, Kansas or the American Royal. We were just at the Blue Rapids uh, parade back in July for their 4th of July parade. So they go everywhere. It takes a lot of hard work to train them. They definitely test you. They're like horses. They'll test you and see how you are like Tip right now, he keeps moving forward. I don't want him to move forward, so I keep making him move back. Just a lot of hard work, patience, and a lot of groundwork, because you walk beside him the whole time, and it's all voice command. Whoa, whoa, boys back. Tip, buck, back, 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 boys back, boys back. Boys back, buck back, tip back, back, whoa. And they definitely know that they are bigger than you, so you have to earn that respect with them. And I like using oxen and working oxen because not everyone has them. And it's a great learning opportunity to share with people, especially people who think these are just bulls or cows. Um, so it's neat to share about the history about them and the pioneers and how they brought the pioneers across the plains. It wasn't horses, it was mainly oxen. Being an animal science major, um, it's really given me appreciation towards animals and where beef came from and 
a little about the pioneers has really gave me a greater appreciation for oxen and history and the animal science industry. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress, powered by Kansas farmers. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com.